Hello and welcome to Facebook Live from Breast Cancer Now. My name's Rachel, I'm one of the nurse specialists and I am thrilled to be joined by Dr Liz O'Riordan who um, is a breast surgeon and has had breast cancer herself and is a author and she's going to tell you some, about um, one of her books. I believe she's writing another one at the moment. And tonight we're going to be talking about debunking the myths that surround nutrition and breast cancer, something that we get asked all the time about on our helpline and our Ask Our Nurse service. Um, so we've had loads of questions in. So without much more of ado, Liz, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything before we get going on the questions. Um, thanks, Rachel, and hi, everyone. I must say, as a consultant breast surgeon, I had no idea that patients had all these questions about diet and nutrition. And then when I was diagnosed, I was bombarded with people telling me, eat this, don't eat that. I had no idea it was a thing. So it's great to be able to talk through all your questions and hopefully give you some sensible advice. Brilliant. And just to say as well, I didn't mention that you can put your um, comments and questions in the chat section um, and in the comment section, sorry. And if we don't get to them tonight, I will answer them tomorrow morning. Um, so hopefully one way or the other, you will you will get an answer. So um, should we start off with um, dairy? Yes, let's do. And you, do you want to carry on? Because we've got lots of questions around it. And yeah, sure. The so I remember when I was a trainee, a book came out by a woman who said she cured her breast cancer by avoiding dairy. And it was a big thing. And when I actually went and read the book, she had had surgery. She had had some form of treatment and the dairy was stopping her cancer coming back. But she'd already had surgery and she was taken to moxifen. A lot of the evidence for dairy comes from a thing called the China study, which looked at people in Japan. And they basically said that one of the proteins in dairy can cause cancer to grow. But this study is flawed. And there's a woman called Denise Minger, who has gone through every single trial and said, basically, this man took the bits that he liked and made a case for them. There's two proteins in milk. One is casein, which he says causes cancer, but the other is whey, which actually stops you getting cancer. It's completely flawed. To date, there is no clear evidence that dairy foods cause breast cancer. They increase the risk of it. They protect you from it. It is completely safe to drink any form of milk you like, whether it's cow, goat, almond, oat, they are all completely safe. It is a myth. Brilliant. Let me just check whether we had questions about whether estrogen receptor positive, is it safe? Yes. It is. Um, does dairy affect cancer? Um, no. Dairy cons link between dairy consumption and breast cancer. I mean, maybe one of the things to just mention is, obviously, dairy, you've got... Uh, the issue with lots and lots of dairy, cheese, all those yeah. things, and weight gain, so, which we'll talk a little bit about. Exactly. Sure. It comes down to a well-balanced diet. And there are people who eat a lot of dairy, so cheese and if you want to call it eggs and yogurt and milk. And they're quite fatty. They have quite high cholesterol. That can all lead to things like heart disease and weight gain, which aren't good for you. So it's eating what you'd have in a normal, a normal healthy, balanced diet. But dairy itself is not going to cause breast cancer. Thank you. Um, I've just got a, let me just see if I can pull that back up. Um, I've just got a question from the floor. Elia, hello, I've just been diagnosed with secondary breast cancer and was put on ribocyclib, but it made me very ill. Just want to know what's the best to take food and vitamin wise. Thank you. It's a great answer. And ribocyclobs, they can often bring on nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, often side effects that you can get during chemo. And I know I really struggled when you have this tablet that's trying to give you quality of life, but you don't know what to eat. And I want to recommend a book. This is backwards, but it's the Royal Marsden Cancer Cookbook, and it's written by their dietitian, Claire Shaw. This saved my marriage. This book tells you what a healthy, balanced diet is, what you should eat. It has recipes for when you use it, you change, you lose your sense of taste, recipes if you're feeling sick, things for diarrhea, how to help you gain weight, how to help you lose weight. And it's got breakfast, dinner, puddings, smoothies. It's a brilliant book of safe recipes of things to try when you're feeling miserable and you don't want to eat. This was my go-to guide and I've given it to so many people. It's a really great place to start for ideas. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just before we move on, Carol's asking, what about soya? 
Oh, this old chestnut. I love this. Mm. Again, myths have come looking at Japan of women who had a lot of soya and they think it increases the risk of breast cancer. But there are studies that say that soya can actually be protective. Yeah. You can't compare populations and you can't compare diets because soya is just one aspect of someone's lifestyle. They may be very healthy. They may not drink a lot of alcohol. And because there are some that say yes and some that say no, we know there's no real evidence. There is no evidence to say that soy is either dangerous or it's good for you. And again, as part of a healthy, balanced diet, it's fine. It doesn't increase the risk of obesity and positive breast cancer. You shouldn't be eating five portions of soy a day every day for years. That's just too much. But it's safe as part of a balanced diet. And probably another thing to add there is that soya supplements are not indicated no soya supplements often have a much greater amount of soya than you would get from things like tofu so you should avoid soya supplements because they're often they're often not regulated you don't really know what's in them they're not controlled and we did get quite a few questions about supplements um yeah do you want me to tackle that now sure so i'm amazed on instagram and facebook how the cancer wellness industry has taken off and there are so many people telling you to have this supplement turmeric turmeric or curcumarin or berberin or take this or take that or mushrooms so many things i have never heard of and they all say this saved my life this can cure your cancer but ask your doctor that's their caveat the thing is if you have a healthy well-balanced diet leafy fruit and veg rainbow of food protein you do not need any extra supplements because they all come from a healthy balanced diet there is no one supplement that is a magic bullet and often when you dig deep into the people pushing these trials, they're either selling them, so they're trying to make money off the back of them, or the papers have been done to prove a point. It's not accurate evidence. And it may make you feel better spending your money on these supplements, like CBD is the latest one, but there is no evidence that they will cure your cancer. And if you've had breast cancer treatment, most of us are cancer-free. There may be some dormant cells that may wake up down the line. That's what tamoxifen is doing. They're not actually curing anything. And I would say it's a waste of money. At the most, you could take a general multivitamin tablet and a calcium and vitamin D tablet if you're on an aromatase inhibitor to strengthen the bones. You do not need anything else. Fantastic. And um, just to mention that we will put some links in um, onto the Facebook page so that you can have a look at particularly the Sloan Kettering Herbal site. Yeah which is a great it's reference isn't it it's fantastic you can put in every single supplement and it will tell you what it's used for what the risks are what the evidence is doctors don't know i haven't heard of half of these supplements and that tells you something because if we knew mushrooms cured cancer your oncologist would be telling you to have them we'd be telling children from birth give your daughters mushrooms mm. if your doctor hasn't heard of them you've got to think maybe this isn't all it's cut out to be brilliant um, and the other thing that we will put up is um, our diet and breast cancer booklet. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. Breast cancer now. Um, should we talk about diet and weight loss? Is it as simple as calories in versus calories out or is there more to it? It is that simple but it's really, really, really hard. So mm. I used to tell patients, there's no evidence that tamoxifen makes you gain weight. It doesn't. And then I was put on tamoxifen and I gained five kilos and I'm slim, but that was still 10% of my body weight. And I realized, hang on, it's all because of the menopause. When you stop producing estrogen or your estrogen levels drop, your metabolism slows down and you become more likely to store weight around the middle of your tummy and it's much harder to shift it. So although it is calories in, calories out, you have to work harder and diet isn't enough. It is a good healthy diet and it's exercise. It's boring. There is no magic cure. You can't shift two kilos in a week with just water weight. The trick for most of us with diet is eating enough protein. Mm. I used to live off bagels and cereal. I couldn't be bothered to cook. I don't like porridge. I don't like eggs for breakfast. And when I started weight training, and I come on to why you should do that, I had to have protein at every meal. 30 grams of protein at every meal, which is much more than I was having. And I used to have a chocolate protein shake as a milkshake um, for breakfast. The minute I did that, I wasn't snacking on biscuits because I felt full. And the weight I was putting on was muscle weight, not fat weight. It made a huge difference. You combine that with exercise. We know exercise can halve 
the risk of your cancer coming back. That's far more than any supplements you're being flogged and it's free. And it has to be aerobic exercise when you get hot and sweaty and resistance training, the lunges and the squats. You start doing the resistance training with more protein in your diet, you will start shifting the weight. It's really hard after the menopause and life is really, really unfair. Can be done. A lot of women don't put on weight, but it is hard work. Um, it's, it's just one of the kickers of the drugs we give you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's 80-20. I will still have ice cream or a magnum. You know, I, I, I eat well most of the time and I give myself a treat because I've had cancer and life, life is tough and you can't put yourself on a restrictive diet. So it's just really simple common sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Catherine's asking, are there any foods that should be cut out during treatment? I think you've kind of covered that. Caffeine, well, let's, carbs. So I'd say caffeine, there are things that can affect your side effects. So caffeine and alcohol can make hot sweats and night flashes worse and spicy foods. And a lot of women will just cut them out or stop them because it's never worth a night's sleep. I will still have a glass of bubbly and no, I shouldn't because I'll be dripping in sweat all night. So you can cut out foods to affect the symptoms of the menopause. There are foods that you may be told to avoid if you're having chemotherapy. And that is because of the risk of an infection. The chemotherapy drops your white blood count and infection can be serious. And in some cases it can kill. So we want to make sure you don't get food poisoning. And you may be told to avoid things like raw fish, blue cheese. Some people say don't get anything from a deli counter or pre-packed sandwiches. Make sure everything is refrigerated. You've got really good food hygiene because if you were to get a stomach bug from say salmonella from a dodgy piece of chicken, it could be really serious. But apart from that, there is no food stuff that you need to cut out. So again, there's um, a really good web link, which I will um, organize to be put up for you on um, foods to avoid when you're having chemotherapy yeah. um, onto our website. Um, something else that comes up a lot is about alcohol. How much alcohol is risky? Great question. Well, theoretically, one unit of alcohol is risky because we know alcohol is a carcinogen. By itself, it can cause liver cancer and it can also increase the risk of you getting breast cancer. And it's binge drinking. It's girls going out at a uni and having two bottles of vodka at the weekend. And it's, al- it's also worse in postmenopausal women who drink a lot of alcohol. We know this. And I drank like a fish at university as a medical student. And it's, it's hard for me to think, God, it's my fault because I drank a lot. You have to forget what's gone in the past. It is true that as well as increasing your risk of getting breast cancer, so if you have a BRCA gene, you've got a family history, you can encourage your daughters to not drink a lot of alcohol. We know it can increase the risk of it coming back. And the guidance is around five to six units per week. And a unit is not what you think, because it's a tiny glass of wine. It's not a wine that you pour at home. One gin and tonic. It's it's little the less the better really and it's really hard I think I drank more champagne during chemo than I had in the five months before because I wanted to celebrate all those small wins and that's fine you can enjoy yourself you think I've had cancer sod it I want to drink that's fine every now and again that's fine but if you're drinking half a bottle of wine every night there is a risk it could increase the risk of recurrence now I know someone asked should I drink alcohol on when I've got secondary breast cancer yeah and that made me think. I'd never thought about that. I went and did my research. And I think it's a tough one. We don't know. Your cancer has already come back. And that's really shit. And you may want to drink. And actually, well, what's the worst it can do? It can't make it come back. I don't think alcohol interacts with the drugs that you're given. But it may make side effects worse. But as far as I'm concerned, it's the same. A little every now and then won't do you any harm. Yeah. Fantastic. Would you, what does breast cancer now think about alcohol, Rachel? Because it's contentious. I mean, exact, it? Exactly what you said. I mean, and uh, it, it really, at some level, as with diet, you've got to enjoy life and enjoy yeah. what you enjoy. So if moderation in all things. You, if you're being told no more wine, no more cake, you've got to exercise. You think, I've had cancer. This isn't fair. You have mm. to enjoy yourself. But, but alcohol, I would say in moderation. Mm. And I, I really love um, your uh, advice around protein and reducing carbs and just thinking about strengthening up the muscles, the leg muscles, yeah. particularly if you're on aromatase inhibitors, keeping those muscles strong, keeping yourself strong. 
Um, it's a great, a great way to be if you can get yourself going. And that might be just a brisk walk, something very, and very simple. Whilst we're there, I'm going to briefly exercise. I, I didn't do any weight training at all, even though I knew it, it, it increased my chances of staying alive. I didn't do it. So I forced myself to start during lockdown. But what do you do? Not everyone can afford to join a gym. The reasons you do it are, as Rachel said, it improves your bone strength because if you're swimming and cycling don't count, you've got to be putting pressure through your bones to strengthen them. Even with metastatic cancer, it is still really important to do the strength work because it keeps you out of bed. It keeps you moving. It is so important. Two books. Now, these are going to be backwards, but um, they're, they're the right way round. Oh, for you. Great. Carolyn Garrett has had breast cancer. She's a PT. Get your oomph back. Shows you cardio even for people in a wheelchair and resistance exercises you can do at home with a resistance band and she's got people in there from 30 to 80 all doing it it's really really easy another book by an amazing woman in america called katherine schmitz who's behind all the evidence for how exercise reduces the risk of cancer is moving through cancer she goes through all the evidence to show you why you should do it and again with simple resistance bands and water bottles she tells you what to do at home so you can do it at home really cheaply. It is the best thing you can do to take control, to stop it coming back. Yeah, but it's all, and it's also amazing for you mentally. Oh God, yes, hugely. When I'm mm. exercising, I'm just Liz, I'm not a cancer patient. And that is yeah. such an important part of my day. Absolutely. Um, with a question from Nikki, I think we probably answered this, does sage leaf help with night sweats? I think it does, actually. And when well, my oncologist told me that sage can help with night sweats, I'm not sure of the dose. It's safe to take. Um, it will work for some people. It won't work for others. But I think that as a supplement, it's worth trying. We mm. do suggest not taking things like black cohosh and St. John's wort because they can interfere with tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is metabolized by a certain enzyme in the liver and various supplements can interfere with it. But I think sage is fine. Um, is that what I you heard as well? Rachel? I don't. I don't know um, much about it. I'd have to. I'd have to do a bit of research and have a look. Probably I on think it's safe to take. I don't know how much. Um, I don't know what the dose is. It's worth trying. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's a huge problem, isn't it? Night sweats yeah. and just general menopause effects and side effects of treatment. Um, we've talked a lot about that in the past, haven't yeah. we? We um, have. I think exercise can actually help exhaust you so you get a good night's sleep i often mm. sleep better when i've done a really hard workout i've got separate duvets and a lot of women sleep in those running tops that wick the sweat away well um, that's a good idea i haven't thought about yeah. that one so running tops that wick the sweat away i avoid alcohol or caffeine after six seven o'clock at night and there are lots of alternatives to hrt that can help so it's worth exploring mm. those with your gp mm. and i know you've been talking a lot about that haven't you liz over on the Instagram. yes Yes, there's a, there'll be an article in the Mail on Sunday talking about HRT and breast cancer and what the medical experts think. Um, it is controversial at the moment, and I'm a bit cross about it, but we're talking about diet and nutrition here. But um, yeah, yeah, always. Um, any more questions from the floor? Let me just have a look at the other questions. Um, Estrogen positive cancer. If you have yeast bread, is it not good for you? Should I give it up? Nope. There is no food. Um, a lot of bread may be bad for you because it will make you feel bloated and it might make you put on weight. But the purpose of bread is to have salted butter and salted butter is a good thing. Mm. Um, it's everything in moderation. Um, very, although a lot of foods are meant to have estrogen, like you know, cow's milk that have been fed with antibiotics and, and the, the, the meat from the state's pumped full of hormones, you eat so little it really doesn't make any difference. And that brings me on to red meat. Mm. I did an article in the Eye newspaper about this when a huge study came out saying that eating processed meat and red meat increases your risk of getting breast cancer. And everyone was terrified, no more bacon sandwiches. Now, if you're not vegetarian, a bacon sandwich is a good thing. And I had a look at this and it's ridiculous. The studies of people who were eating an awful lot of processed meat, so bacon and sausage every day for months and months and months. And they said that it increases your risk of breast cancer by 9%. And that sounds like a really huge figure, but it's relative risk. And we don't explain this very well to people. Doctors are very numerical and we throw numbers around, but what does it mean for you? So let me try and break that down. Your lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is around 12%. 
when you're 20, it's really, really, really small. And when you get up to 90, it's closer to 50%. But on average of your life, it's 12% chance. So one in seven, one in eight chance. If processed meat increases your risk by 9%, it's increasing that 12% risk by 9% which actually takes it from 12 to 13%, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny increase over your life. So if you're 30 and you've got a one in 2000 chance of getting breast cancer, that's now maybe one in 1500, which is still tiny. So the impact of red meat on you and your diet is almost irrelevant, but you don't hear that you hear it doubles your risk. Yes, it may double your risk, but it's still really, really, really small. And that's why it's important to take all these studies with a pinch of salt. Compare that with smoking that increases your risk by 500 percent. And yet mm. people know this and they still smoke. But we get paranoid about a little bit of bacon. So, mm. again, it's just remembering everything that you read in tabloids and Instagram and social media, Facebook. Just think, actually, is this true? Mm. And, and really just to say to you all out there. Ask us a question. We have, um, ask our nurse service. We will do the research for you. We will give you a full answer to your yeah. question. Call us on the helpline. We'll always look things up for you if we don't know the answer straight away. 0808 800 6000. You know, we're here for you Monday to Friday and Saturday mornings. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a question flash up about supplements yeah. of people on the CDK4 inhibitors. So that's the palbocyclib, the abemocyclib. Um, because of the, how these drugs work and how they're metabolized, there is a risk that any extra supplement might interfere with them. That's the same with chemotherapy drugs and tamoxifen. They work in a very specific way. And if you are taking supplements, they could encourage cells, normal cells to grow. They could interfere with how the drug is metabolized. Theoretically, you shouldn't need any supplements if you're eating a healthy, well-balanced diet. A single multivitamin is completely safe, but if you're having extra supplements, they could do damage. You don't need them. A lot of the time your body makes enough and you just pee them out in your urine. Um, you don't need them. You really, really don't. You just need a healthy, well-balanced diet. Again, there are smoothies and things you can do if, if you're feeling sick, losing weight with diarrhea. You shouldn't be taking them. There shouldn't be any need. Your doctors will tell you what supplements you need. Mm. Yeah, and uh, if you're not sure, Again, look at our ask, website. Ask breast cancer now and say, can I take curcumin? Can I take berberin? What about turkey tail? They will do the research. Yeah. They will come back to you and let you know. Um, yeah. Don't believe what you read and hear because everybody's taking it. So one, one way to, you hear someone saying this is the latest diet, like, you know, mushrooms or, or sugar. I can come on to sugar in a minute. Someone's selling, telling you something cures cancer. Are they selling you something? Are they selling you a course or a product or a book? If someone is pushing a product, the chances are they're biased and they're not doing this to help you. They're doing this to make money. NHS doctors, breast care nurses, we give our advice for free. We're not, you're not paying us to tell you what you want. So it's really important to have a look. But we could talk about sugar because that's the big yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Does sugar cause cancer? And if I cut sugar out of my diet, will it stop me getting cancer? Will it stop my cancer coming back? Oh, I love debunking this one. It sounds great. You know, sugar in donuts and cakes and sweets, cut it all out, you'll be cured forever. Bollocks. Because carbohydrates, which include the bread, pasta, rice, grains, all vegetables, all fruits, as well as the sugar and donuts, are all basically sugar. They are all broken down to two or three different molecules of glucose, fructose. They're all sugar. So if you want to cut, cut sugar out of your diet, you are going to be living off protein and fat, which your body will still break down to make a form of sugar. So it is impossible to cut sugar out of your diet. But here's the thing. Your cells need sugar to live, to grow, to thrive. It's their main energy food source. When you don't have it, they use protein and fat, but the body doesn't like it. So if you starve your cancer cells by cutting out sugar, you are starving the whole body you are making yourself sick and most cancer treatments say chemotherapy and radiotherapy need the cancer cells to be fast growing so they can kill them so trying to starve during chemotherapy and radiotherapy can actually do more harm than good but you can't cut out sugar and it doesn't stop cancer coming back it's just a rubbish diet that's a really easy gimmick to sell there's no truth to it at all thank you 
Um, I think, oh, we had a question about magnesium. Is it a good yes. thing? If you're a chemist, <laughs> you don't need it. It's a, it, it's a, it's a tiny um, mineral that you'll get in your diet. You don't need to supplement on it. Some people say magnesium can help with um, healing and your immune system. And there may be some truth in that, but you shouldn't need to take a supplement just because of magnesium. Your body only needs tiny, tiny amounts. They're trace elements. And you'll probably find, as I said, you'll pee out most of the tablet you're taking because your body doesn't need it and it can't hang on to it. Some people use magnesium salts to kind of make them feel better in the bath and that's fine, but you don't need it. If it makes you feel better and you want to spend your money on it and you're not taking a drug like tamoxifen, then fine. I spend the money on a nice face cream. <laughs> um what else should, should we talk about the alkaline diet oh yeah that comes up quite a lot there's been a lot of influencers who are saying that you need to go alkaline it's a new thing alkalize your body get rid of all the acid it's the acid and the stress that's causing cancer and it sounds great and they tell you to drink to like you know the lemon juice and water and drink all this stuff to make your body alkaline and it's complete rubbish because alkaline and acid are based on a thing called, system called pH, which basically tells you how acidic or alkaline your body is. The lower the number, the more acidic it is. So one or two is acid. And if it's nine or 10, it's alkaline. Your body runs bang in the middle at about 7.34. It is tightly controlled because 95% of the enzymes in your body need your blood to be at that pH so they can work. If you go from 7.4 to 7.1, that could put you in ITU with acidosis. It is that tightly controlled. Regardless of what you eat or drink, it goes into the stomach, which is acidic. It's broken down. And then as it's digested, it's neutralized. Everything else is peed out or done by the liver. Your body has to be at a neutral pH. So you can eat whatever you like. It will not change the pH of your body. It's a gimmick. It's just a gimmick and people don't like it when we tell them it's rubbish. It makes them feel good. They can do test the pH of their urine. It's really alkaline. Of course it is because you'd be putting a load of alkaline foods in from the top. They're just going to come out the other end. It's a minefield, isn't it? It really is. I had no idea. So in my book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, we debunk all these diets. There's the Gershwin diet where you live off cottage mm. cheese curds and grapes. There are so many things and clinics promising them. If they worked, your doctors would tell you. Yeah. Uh, let me just scroll back up again. Um, should people with breast cancer request a vitamin D measurement? Mine was really low and took a significant amount of supplements to get it up to normal. This is really interesting. We don't routinely measure it, but we know from COVID that an awful lot of people had low vitamin D levels. And give, my husband had COVID and he had a massive dose of vitamin D to boost him up. So we're kind of discovering it. I think we spend our lives inside, not out in the sunshine. So most of us probably do have low vitamin D. I think if, you are, if you're on tamoxifen, it protects your bones. If you're on an aromatase inhibitor, um, your bones can get weak and thin. So everybody should be on a calcium and vitamin D supplement anyway. And you should be getting bone scans, DEXA scans every couple of years to see. It's something you could ask your GP to do to see if your levels are low. It's not done routinely. Maybe it should be something we do, but I think a general bone vitamin supplement is a good thing. Uh, the next one, diagnosed with breast cancer 2021, surgery, chemo, Herceptin, radiotherapy, letrozole, Demeter, taking calcium, walking the dog every day, longer walks on weekends, eat a healthy diet, struggling to lose weight. Does low levels of estrogen hinder weight loss? We'll definitely Have I start frozen? strength training. No, we're still I'm there. I'm still here. Okay, my screen's frozen here. Low estrogen hinders weight loss by making you menopausal. It slows the metabolism down, like we said before. It's really, really hard. And some women don't gain weight. Some women gain a lot. And it comes back to healthy eating, protein every meal exercising and weight training and you may find you need to exercise more and eat less to lose the weight that you did before you hit the menopause but it sounds um sounds like you might have been um encouraged deb 
yeah to... it sounds like you're doing all the right things it will work it's slow and steady keep up with the exercise and let us know how you get on yes yeah well done for taking that plunge um i've been taking i can't say this word spirulina yeah i think it's that actually as recommended by a friend who also has had breast cancer does this help with chemo symptoms I have no idea. I know it's yeah. a kind of like a, a, what they call a superfood, the super greens. People take it to kind of boost their immune system. I don't think there's any strength, any, any benefit to it. It's just one of those new health food supplements. And a lot of people do this. They go, Julia Bradbury did an awful lot of juicing superfoods, spirulina and goji berries and all sorts of things. I don't think they do anything to affect chemo symptoms. I think that's an independent thing. Some women struggle, some people don't. And again, when your taste buds change in chemo, it's really hard to know what you want yeah. to eat. If it makes you feel better, take it. But I don't think there's any evidence to show it's helping. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really about what you've just said, because your taste changed so much. It's trying it to find food that you can eat maybe little and often that doesn't irritate your exactly. mouth. Exactly. And that's why this book is brilliant for things when your mouth is sore, your gums are bleeding, mm. those taste changes. You see celebrities spending an awful lot of money on all these supplements. It's really expensive. You don't need them, mm -hmm. um, if that helps. Um, question for you, Liz. What's yeah. your favourite healthy go-to meal? Oh, I just had it this evening, actually. It's by, um, I've forgotten her name, Diana, Diana Henry. It's a coronation chicken salad um, with mango mm -hmm. and avocado and chicken and lettuce and um, ground almonds. No, flaked almonds. It's just really light and simple and healthy and colourful. Um, and it makes enough for three or four days. So I really like something like that that's simple and easy to prepare. Mm. My husband cooks and I do puddings and gravy. Fantastic. <laughs> that's how we roll in our house. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, Fiona says, should we be avoiding non-organic milk, chicken, etc.? So should you be eating organic food? No. If it makes you feel better and you want to know where your food is coming from and you can afford to do that, then it's fine. But from a cancer point of view, organic food does not make one jot of difference. Patricia, say, oh, sorry. Patricia says um, she was told uh, to avoid raw vegetables and fruit after radiotherapy. What? Mm. I have never heard of that. That makes no sense at all. Radiotherapy is purely targeting the tissues inside. It's got nothing to do with that. And that may be on the belief that do they slow cell growth down and make radiotherapy worse or change the side effects there is no there's no science to that at all just as i've got he's awful an american doctor called mark hyman um put a twitter thing out on saturday and on instagram saying that when you cut broccoli and vegetables and you crush garlic you should leave them on the side for half an hour so they can get bruised and that will increase their anti-carcinogenic effects it's rubbish but people believe this because this guy with a hundred thousand followers said it it's just crazy mm, it's just so wrong um any more questions before we finish calling for those last nuggets i don't think have we missed anything out do you think there's i'm just scrolling through um question about chickpeas i chickpeas are fine mm. i've had a look and there's a little bit of science to say that chickpeas may do some harm but it's not proven so how long after chemo should you start eating unsafe foods? Oh, grapefruit and tamoxifen. Oh, good question. We'll come to that. So after chemo, it probably takes a good two to three weeks for your white cell counts to climb back up again to normal. And you'll probably have post-chemo bloods. And I think once your bloods are normal, then it's fine to start eating all the foods you couldn't. But you need to wait a fortnight to get out of that danger period. Have we all frozen? No. No, fine. Sorry, I just wasn't moving. Yeah, no, it's fine. Don't worry. The grapefruit <laughs> thing, we've done a video on this. The, the old fashioned teaching used to be that grapefruit interferes with the enzyme that uh, metabolizes tamoxifen. But I think new research has shown the evidence is weak. It may, mm. but it may not. And I think a little bit of grapefruit every now and again is absolutely fine. I wouldn't say have it every day for breakfast and drink grapefruit juice all the day because you, that may be doing more harm than good. But again, every once in a while as part of a healthy balanced diet i think grapefruit is fine that's yeah. what we came to agree with wasn't it, i mean the, the evidence we, we went across we actually went across the world to collect the evidence you did. and looked at it uh both you and i and various other great minds 
I'll say we've got great minds. And uh, we, yes, we came to very strongly to the conclusion, having asked many, many surgeons, yeah. oncologists about tamoxifen and grapefruit, and everybody agreed that it is fine yes. to have grapefruit. It does not affect the way no. tamoxifen works. So no. um, Anne says, soy or not, with ER positive. It's safe. It's safe. Just don't eat it every day, three times a day, because that might be silly. But do not take soy supplements because they yeah. have a much higher level of soy. They're not controlled. You don't know what's in them. But tofu, tempeh, soy milk, it's all completely safe. Mm. Uh, if you and remember, sorry. you are taking tablets such as tamoxifen or an astrazole to completely shut down the estrogen you're producing. Mm. Uh, Fiona says, I was told not to lose weight during chemo, but I changed my diet as it, as it had become unhealthy during lockdown. And I upped my exercise, but didn't overdo it and lost weight, but only the pandemic excess. Any guidance on maintaining weight during chemo? This is really hard. Um, a lot of women put on weight because they snack for the sickness. So often just snacking constantly on crackers can help with the nausea. And the steroids that you're given can make you really, really hungry. Whereas other people like me, I would lose three kilos every chemo week just in water weight because I wasn't eating. You want to try and keep you at a healthy weight because if you lose weight, we have to change the amount of drug we give you. The, the Royal Marsden book, again, has great ideas for if you want to lose weight or gain weight. So to, to keep your weight stable, things like making mashed potato but loading it with double cream and butter to sneak calories in that way. There are things you can do to keep your weight stable. Out of chemo, out of treatment, again, it's exercising in a healthy diet to shift any weight that you have um, and, and protein to put the weight back on. So you're putting on more muscle than fat. Um, some women are going to lose weight just because that's how they cope on chemo. And it is really hard. Um, so uh, and it's something else that, that I will make sure we link in it are the mm -hmm. YouTube videos that we did with a dietitian called Adele. Yeah, they're Hug. fantastic. Yeah. Really, really good. So I'll, I'll pop, make sure we pop those in too. Um, just got a few more questions now. Um, I'm low in calcium. This is from Rebecca. What should I be eating to help, to help the supplements prescribed? So calcium, um, a good sources of milk, um, spinach, leafy green vegetables, and also getting some sunshine in because calcium and vitamin D are absorbed together. So you do need the two. But again, um, and you can check on any simple website, um, health food website will tell you where you can find calcium. Yeah. And it's definitely in our booklet, so I will yeah, make sure we add, we add that in. Um, how can we motivate, uh, this is from Anna, how can we motivate ourselves to stay on the same level healthy? Oh, that's a really good question. And something I struggle with because I think it's an emotional roller coaster. Mm. For me, I felt my body's been given a second chance. I've come through cancer treatment. I want to stay as healthy as I can for whatever happens in the future. And 80% of the time I'm good. And then 20% of the time I think, oh, sod it, I can't be asked. You know, my mom's just got cancer. What's the point? I'll go and eat a pack of biscuits so my husband doesn't know. It's, it's giving yourself a break and doing the best you can. Um, and remembering you have, you can take control of your future by exercising, by maintaining a healthy weight, by not drinking a lot of alcohol, you can halve your risk of breast cancer coming back. And if that can give you something positive, something you can actually control, that may be the way in. Yeah. Um, Jackie, uh, CBD oil? Oh, no, there's no real evidence. Um, CBD oil is the non-hallucinogenic aspect of cannabis and it's everywhere. Everyone and their mother are promoting CBD gummies and CBD juice, but there is no scientific evidence that it will have any impact on your cancer. It may help with inflammation. It may help with stress. It's not like the cannabis that is given for chronic pain and nausea for advanced breast cancer patients. I'd say it's just a nutrition fad. It makes you feel better. You want to spend your money on it. That's fine. But there's no real evidence to say it has an impact on your cancer outcome. Um, Susie says, I'm having my first chemo this Friday, had a mastectomy February 2021. Am I right to eat everything I fancy initially? Yes. Your, your taste will probably change within the first 12, 24 hours. Um, and you'll find it goes quite quickly and it can be really frustrating not knowing what to eat. And then it will gradually come back towards the end of the cycle. I think in chemo, you eat what you like. 
and you won't know what you like until you're going through it. You may find that tea and coffee tastes awful or you fancy a packet of crisps, but they taste different. And it's kind of trial and error, isn't it, Rachel? Mm, definitely. Definitely. Um, eat what you like when you feel like it. Enjoy when your taste. I would drink wine and have chocolate when my taste came back because I could actually taste them, mm. knowing that I wouldn't be able to enjoy mm. them for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And things that you really, really enjoyed can taste really awful. Yeah, it took six months for tea to taste normal. And I, I lived off chicken soup and crossless white bread and I now can't eat it again because it just takes me straight back there. Yeah. What I did drink a lot of though was um, Bovril and Marmite and Vegemite in hot water. Mm, salty. Everyone, everyone sent me ginger and lemon tea bags so I never want to have another one again. And you want that kind of taste. You want some kind of unami. People often have a lot of soy sauce or chili miso. or coriander, miso to give you that kind of flavour but mm. nothing too spicy. Okay. Okay. Well, we're coming to our last question now. It's from Sharon. Any foods to help with low energy following radiotherapy? Oh, the fatigue is the worst. And I didn't get it until I had it. And it is bone crushing. I cannot lift my head off the sofa. I don't think there's any one food that will give you your energy back. Sadly, you're going to hate me for saying this. The best cure for fatigue is exercise. Yeah. Sorry. It's the last thing you want to do, but it works. I'd say anything that makes you feel good. Force yourself to go for a walk and then come back and have a magnum on the sofa. And if you're not, just to say, Sharon, if you're not feeling any better, do let your breast care nurse know because you might just yeah. need to have your blood checked. and, and just Definitely. Check yeah. Everything. Make sure you're not anemic. Um, mm. if, if you are really, really struggling after a week or two and it's not getting better, definitely get it checked out. But going for a walk every day can really, really help. It, Sorry. So right. So right. it's boring it's boring mm. it's a healthy diet and exercise yeah you don't need to spend your money on supplements or crazy diets I yeah. know it sounds like something you can control but they're not going to do what they say they will thank you so much Liz another amazing session this will um obviously be saved on Facebook and we'll go on to our YouTube account if you have any questions, pop them in the comment box and I will answer them tomorrow morning. Um, we will put all the links in that, that we've talked about tonight so that you can find those. And um, remember, our helpline's open tomorrow, 0808 800 6000. You can leave us a message now or you can send us an Ask Our Nurse email if you've got questions that you wanted to ask. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, everyone.